Hello, everyone. Welcome to the second preliminary round of the 15th Process Innovation Challenge brought to you by Lokworld. I'm Alex Burnett, thrilled to be here with my co-host, Dave Ruan. Dave, how are you today? Really good. I mean, this is the second session. We've had a really large number of submissions come in. And, you know, this is a place where you can hear what's going on in the localization industry vis-a-vis -vis innovation. So we had a great first uh, session yesterday, eight innovators. We'll have another eight or nine today, depending. We have one person who may pull out, uh, but very excited. At the end of today's session, uh, this recording will be published within a, the, an hour or two afterwards on Loke World's YouTube channel again, so that you and the Dragons will have a chance to go back and uh, watch it again. I see that we have Gabriel coming in here right now, so he will be here. Um, uh, wanted to say that the judges will have the the Process Dragons are going to have the difficult task of deliberating over the weekend, uh, and we'll come up with a decision um, early to middle of next week. So this is the you know 15th time that we, we've done this, and uh, there's two rounds in preliminary, as Alex said. We have a final. What are the rules? Well, three minutes pitch, three slides, and three dragons. And I'm not talking about trees. That's Dublin accent right there. We don't do THs very well. So tree cubed was the concept. Um, and in order to help us, we do have tree dragons, right, Alex? We do. I'd like to welcome our, our, our dragons, uh, Alessandra Benazzi. Alessandra, how are you today? I'm great, Alex. Thank you very much. Very happy to be here. The first round was awesome. I can't wait to see today. So good luck, everybody. <laughs> Thanks, Alessandra. Next, we have Ben Cornelius. How are you, Ben? Oh, got the mute on, I think. Uh, there we go. That's better. Good morning. Uh, great to be here. I'm really glad that we are doing this again this year, and I can't wait to see the presentations today. Thanks, Ben. Last but not least, we have Eric Folks. Eric, how are you? Hi, everyone. Yeah, welcome to this year's uh, pick. Uh, I'm delighted to be here. I am still buzzing on some of the ideas that I got to see yesterday. So I can't wait to see what's going on today. Best of luck, everyone. I'm really looking forward to seeing what you have to share. Thanks, Eric. Now, the dragons might sound soft and nice, but you know, watch <laughs> out for the questions. Yeah, breed and fire indeed. Watch out. Um, yeah, so here's our lineup for today. Um, and we're just going to get started. So Menka will get you on stage. Um, spoiler alert to anyone who's just reading through the list here. Generative AI, yeah, it's showing. It's showing. So we Menka, if you're ready to go, just advise us when you want to move on, on with slides. And over to you. Yeah, I'm ready to go. Okay, hi, my name is Menke Muller. I'm a project team lead for Janus Worldwide. We are an LSP, in a global LSP. And today I want to present to you an innovation that we have this self-developed called Autopilot. Uh, next slide, please. Right, so what is Autopilot about? It's about automation of project management. And we use templates for this. These are collections of data, stable data for a project client, for a project line. And then we select the template for a specific project and we just alter data where we need to, to date uh, to, to alter it. For example, the deadline, uh, different vendor, etc. And in the end, what this will lead to is a management by exception. So if everything goes smoothly, everyone delivers on time, the project manager doesn't have to intervene very much. And basically when something goes wrong, like a work order can't be completed for technical reasons or a vendor misses a deadline, that's when the project manager has to go into a system and do something. Uh, next slide, please. So what do templates look like? This is an example for one of our clients. You can see there are some services on, more or less on the left side, translation, proofreading, quality assurance. On the right side of the screen, you can see some instructions. They are more or less the same for uh, this particular project line. But there are some placeholders, as you can see, there's link and PM name. And these are the kind of data that will change uh, from project to project. And then uh, we basically select this template for a specific project. We change, for example, the deadline, which you can see is more or less at the, the top or center of your screen called plant finish date. And then on the second workflow tab, uh, you can have uh, some vendor data. There are primary vendors for every target language. But if a vendor isn't available and we know that they're not available, we can go in and change them with our second option. And then it's just a matter of clicking one button. All work orders are created automatically. And then clicking another button to launch the first phase. And when the first phase ends, 
per language, then the next phase starts automatically as well. Um, next slide, please. So what does it lead to? It leads to a lot less manual creation of work orders. As, as I said, it's just one button click. Uh, it leads, leads to fewer interactions with our ERP system because we don't have to do anything when there's an exception. And it also surprisingly leads to earlier deliveries. If a translator delivers earlier, then of course the editor can start earlier. They can deliver earlier in principle and et cetera, et cetera. And in the end, the client will get their languages earlier as well. And that's our innovation. And I hope you find it interesting. Thank you very much. Well done, Manka. Uh, autopilot, huh? Um, let's yes. get some questions for you. Uh, let's, ben, let's start with you. Hi, Manka. That looks like an interesting solution. It looks, sounds like you guys are using that to help your clients out and your internal team. Uh, I noticed right. there was a memo queue label in the screenshot that you shared. So you mentioned this integrates with other platforms. Could you Could you talk about the integration points a little bit? Well, our ERP system has integration with MemoQ, but it's not directly connected to autopilot. But the work orders that we create, they they store data like MemoQ or any other cat too. So it is all connected in, in, in a certain way, but it is not directly connected to autopilot. So make a quick question. This saves time. Let's say it saves the time of the project managers. How much time? What percentage of the, the the effort is reduced by the automation? Uh, yeah, we can hear you, Menke. Could you hear Hello, the question? You? Yes. I don't think Menke can hear us. So, uh, Alex, maybe we, we'd send a message Hello? to. Can you hear me? Yes. Can you hear us, Menka? I don't. I don't hear any of you. I'm. I'm afraid some issue with audio. All of a sudden, I don't know what's going on. So, My Alex, apologies. let's send a message to Menka, and um, we can take that second question, Eric. If you can just remember it, that'll be great, and uh, we'll take that later. Eric, so, could you actually? Uh, why okay, don't you send? You. If you, if you if you want, Eric, can you submit the uh, question for Menka in the uh, in the chat, and he can answer it there, and we'll just move on. Great. Thank you. Well, thank you. Thank you. And next up, we have Kincaid. So Kincaid, we'll ask you to join us. Awesome. Thanks, everyone. OK. Let me spotlight you. And we good to go? You yeah, you can go when ready. When you're ready. Perfect. Uh, yeah. Hey, everyone. My name is Kincaid Day. Um, I'm the director of AI-enabled localization here at Scientific. Uh, I'm thrilled to be here with you today to introduce some of our innovations. Um, so at Scientific, we're using journey tracking and in-context review to bring localized human-centric experiences to scale. Uh, next slide, please. So let's first begin by taking a step back and looking at some numbers. So how do brands lose customers today? Major reason is poor user experience, when the experience feels disconnected or there's inconsistent messaging. However, on the other hand, we know strong localization strategy and local feeling content are key drivers of customer engagement. Without in-market experience, resources, and tools, businesses risk creating content and experiences that fail to resonate and connect with potential customers. Next slide, please. So that's why we've developed JourneyMate, a browser that leverages testers with in-market linguistic experience to review websites from a journey standpoint. Testers follow goals in order and JourneyMate collects information on the journey used to fulfill those goals, giving customers end-to-end -end visibility of pain points. This in-context quantitative feedback can be used for detailed reporting, persona-driven insights, and more. For our localization customers, JourneyMate provides a quick workflow to identify gaps in their experience, assess how localized content is perceived, and pinpoint areas where conversion rates could potentially drop. This eliminates the need for outdated technology like Excel and also enables scaling by connecting the browser directly to our localization talent pool. Next slide, please. The best part about JourneyMate, it's really simple to use. It's like your average browser, but with a layer of tracking and feedback capabilities built in. To facilitate correction of experiences, JourneyMate integrates with platforms that you might already be using today, such as DevOps, Jira, or even Airtable. Ultimately, JourneyMate's goal is to enhance how feedback is collected from people with different backgrounds, directly in context to drive faster market adaptation and to create user experiences that truly feel local. Um, I wanna thank you all for the opportunity today. And with that, I'll hand it back over to the judges for any questions. 
Okay, thank you very much. So no longer is a journey made someone you travel with, it's something else, right? Exactly. Fantastic. Um, dragons, questions? Um, maybe I'll, I'll start. Um, thanks for the presentation. It's great. I, it's a little hard for me to visualize. Can you kind of walk me through like who's doing what maybe at, at a high level? Yeah, absolutely. So what JourneyMate is, it's, it's simply a browser, no different than say Chrome or Edge or anything that you might be used to today. And what we're solving for is we allow in-country resources to access any website, right, on behalf of the customer. Um, we also then have automation built in. So we can simply take, imagine like a URL for amazon.com for a specific vendor, and we can more or less extract the end-to-end -end journey of someone looking for a product going to a conversion point. But now imagine being able to do this for any site in market for any language. From there, we have roughly a million resources in a platform called OneForma. And so we have, you know, specialized resources for various languages, as well as certified resources for many of these top companies that we're all familiar with. So we're able to more or less assess the quality of the experience at scale with specialized resources where they can simply do exploratory testing or truly sequence the way that localized content is being uh, excuse me, perceived. Um, and then, of course, for those newer customers that we're seeing uh, every day that are truly entering into kind of more of the global space with those localization needs, this is a great starting point for them. Because we find a lot of folks, you know, maybe they don't have the spend for localized content. And so they kind of, you know, go with a lower grade uh, MT solution and they don't have any post editing or things of that nature. This truly allows um, them to identify those gaps to see where they're really, you know, missing the opportunity to, um, you know, address the quality. Great stuff. We'll take one quick question. If there's another one, just a quick one. I'll, I'll ask again if you don't. <laughs> um, this is for live websites, I assume, not pre pre live stages like sandboxes or anything. Actually, it can be technically used in any environment. So um, that brings up another good point. This is very lightweight, so it doesn't require you know hours, hours and hours of engineering time. You don't have to have integrations with CMS systems or some of the other marketing technology tools that everyone's familiar with. You simply just need access for that user to that domain. So within the browser, if I can have a, a login credential, technically our interface allows us to map out that entire experience. Um, and then from there, we can extract the data implemented into our LLM technology and all that fun stuff. Thanks. Thank you. Excellent. Kincaid, thank you very much. Well done. And we're going to move on. So next up, we're just going to uh, do a quick swap here. So Matthias, you probably weren't expecting to be on stage well. You know, give you five seconds to uh, get yourself ready there. Uh, I think I'm we'll ready. Back... Good, good. And we'll come back to Gabrielle at the end. So over to you, Matthias, when you're ready. All right. Thank you, Dave. Um, so this year, large language models made serious headlines all over the world. And justifiably, as with these technologies, we see that innovation around content and language is getting a huge boost. But how do you turn these technologies into applications? Well, a popular way is to use LangChain. Next slide, please. For those who don't know, LangChain is a Python framework for developing LLM-based applications suited for very specialized tasks like content repurposing, trends creation, or analysis by LangChaining different technologies together, combining LLM models and prompts. As you can see, this blew up overnight. However, generic LangChain solutions will not cut it for us because we are not dealing with language here. For us, every client is different. Every target audience is different because every person is different. You cannot expect one prompt to work for everyone. Next slide, please. We think, and you can start the video, that generative AI is only useful if you're able to customize it to your use case. And that, that's the real innovation. We think that in order to use LLMs, you should be able to easily integrate it into your current tech stack, even if you don't have one yet. And we think that anything you are inspired by at this pick, you should be able to custom build yourself. So every LSP or localization department can call themselves AI powered. Our workflow orchestrator allows one to build LLM powered automations in a completely visual and user-friendly way. We don't just give you access to these LLMs. We also provide common actions on top of them so you can use these out of the box to make your experience even better. For example, in this video, you can see how I'm setting up an automation that tweets about an article in French. Only one out of an infinite number of use cases. 
We are combining Cohere, OpenAI, and DeepL to analyze, summarize, translate, post edit, and reshape an article into a tweet the moment it's published. Now for the next steps, imagine easily adding your term base or instructing to match the tone of voice of other tweets. The only limitation is your creativity. Next slide, please. You can see our workflow orchestrator as a meta innovation, an innovation that can be the catalyst for much greater things. In a sense, democratizing access to AI models. We are a $50 billion industry right now with workflow orchestration and access to LLMs. We want to help innovate and grow that number a lot bigger. You will be able to deliver tailor-made content faster. Delivering services like automated empty post editing, content identification, or localized transcreation, just to name a few. What you see here is what you can do today. Imagine what you're going to do tomorrow. We think that enabling you to set up highly customized services in minutes is the best innovation we can bring. Whether you want to automate fully, partially, or just use these technologies as an assistant. Thank you. Really interesting, Matthias, this whole idea of customized workflows connecting in. You're basically bringing in new engines that exist, right? So you're, yeah. you're just continuing the idea of workflows can extend and be further customized. Exactly. Brilliant. Dragon's okay, questions. Can, yeah, I can imagine that, uh, that this is, an, well, one, it's an extremely efficient way of delivering multilingual content. Um, one of the things that I'm seeing more and more is the use of one model to verify or to check another. Yeah. Are you able to create loops that may involve, uh, say, the output of one model uh, generating a check against another that might uh, verify something? Let's say a toxicity check of some kind yeah. and then bounce that back. Uh, tell us a little more about how that would work. Sure, this is exactly the premise that Langchain initially tried to provide by combining not just uh, one model and getting it as output, but using it as actually the input for another action and have perhaps even a totally different model that's offered, uh, do some checks. And something like uh, sensitive content uh, verification, even uh, we know of models that do uh, personal identifiable information detection, you can use them, for example, in that pipeline in order to uh, yeah, build up some checks and balances. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah. Another question from Dragons? I mean, Tias, I, I noticed there was, there was no code there. So yes. when you think about the users that are sitting behind their keyboard and looking at this in their browser, do you feel like that's um, PMs or, or, or what type of users do you feel like this is going to be used by out here in localization? Anyone who's enthusiastic about it. Uh, we want to provide the experience for everyone. You don't need to be a programmer. Uh, however, if you have more technical uh, capabilities, you are actually able to extend uh, the actions that you can perform and that you can put in your pipeline with custom code, actually, yes. Great, great questions. Um, not a big surprise to me that Eric jumped in with a workflow question. Uh, 20 years ago, me and him used to have calls about workflows. Anyway, that's a, another story. Um, great job, Matthias. Um, Thank you. Let's move on. So Teresa, we'll ask you to join us on stage. You're very welcome to the pick. And uh, we'll get you set up. All right, sounds good. So when you're ready, over to you. Okay. Um, hi, I am Teresa. My name is Teresa Ku and I work for Hopper. Next slide, please. I'm excited to share with you some ideas we're trying as we LQA our mobile first application. So as we expand to new markets and languages, we want to make sure our app is tested consistently with the same coverage in all languages without the burden of test access and test environment logistics. We've thought about how to deal with the common pain points, starting with app setup, lack of context, and quick access to the source. In, and in case they need to fix a string, how can they quickly look up the correct string in the TMS to confidently correct any linguistic bugs? Our goal is to keep it simple, make the test process easy and straightforward rather than painful. So the tester can focus on the linguistics and not the logistics. We want them to spend time on actual testing and not on figuring out how to test. Next slide, please. So how do we do this? For each release, we use test automation to generate screenshots. 
for each of the flows that we care about. We use OCR to extract the strings from the screenshots so we can provide string search capability. We also invented a custom key identifier and text generator we call VisiCode. We consolidate these screenshots into an externally available web page that is easy to navigate. And this is what we give to each tester. One of our innovations is that for each page we want to test, we provide three versions of the screenshot, one in native language, one in English as a quick source reference, and one in VisiCode, which gives us the exact content key lookup. We send the VisiCode key with our translation request, so it's, av it's available in the TMS to search. Next slide, please. A picture is worth a thousand words, so this is a sample of what each tester will see. For each screen in the app that we want validated, they'll see these three versions. On the right is the target language version, in this case, Spanish. And this is primarily what they need to review. In the middle is the English source, so they can quickly compare the translation with the source for accuracy. And on the left is the VisiCode version, which provides the exact content key, in this example, WUHB, so they can go to the TMS and quickly search the exact string they need to fix. The VisiCode version also helps us with internationalization testing. It provides pseudo-localization, if you will. It helps quickly identify text expansion, hard-coded text, or text fragmentation. It even has indicators, which lets you at a glance get an idea of what the maximum string length is. At the bottom of the screenshot is the OCR text, which lets them give a quick, lets them do a quick search to find any occurrences of the same string anywhere on the page. So that's it. I hope you agree that this approach helps enable the tester to focus on linguistics and not logistics so they can do their LQA and bug fixes with confidence. Thank you. Thank you, Teresa. Very interesting. The only question I have is, what did they do in Dallas over the weekend? Did they have a good time? But really good <laughs> visuals, uh, well explained. Thank you. Dragons, do you have questions? Now I'm thinking about what to do in Dallas over the weekend. <laughs> uh, no, what I was going to ask is that the, the compile state is often the blocker, blocker on these. So, um, but this would work for anything not compiled not compilable right or or maybe maybe it doesn't matter you just compile all three versions and then be able to execute it can is this and you use mobile apps as your as your core as your example does this work with other types of um, platform solutions i think primarily our use case was was apps so that's why it was mobile app focus it could be any app probably and even like static pages but really the main use case was for app testing because again, we struggle a lot with testing, with setup, with environments. So this helped eliminate a lot of that. And uh, real estate is tricky. Uh, and I see other localization elements like changing, changing the, uh, the, the currency, for example, would need to be, or date formats may be relevant also. So you can do all of those things in, in that uh, environment. Exactly. So we pre-cook it for them. They don't have to fidget with changing the language, changing the currencies. So that's already visible for them. And if they make a change in the source, uh, how quickly can they see the results to verify? That <laughs> requires a whole additional loop. So that's the hope with regular consistent testing with every release. They can fix it this release and then they can catch it in the next release and validate that it's already fixed. Got it. Okay. That was the part that I was originally kind of the compile step is the is the tough one. Um, thank exactly. You so much. Thank you, Eric. Thank you. A couple of good questions there. Uh, we'll take one last dragon question if there's a quick one. Or not? Um, Great. I had a, oh, yeah, go ahead. Not, we don't need. Go ahead. We can move on. If you have a quick question, let's get it in. Well, just I don't know if I missed it, but uh, and maybe it was the very first step, but how are the screenshots taken? Because that's usually a really cumbersome step. We use test automation. So we already okay, that's test what was the automation yeah. internally. Exactly. So it's a byproduct of the test automation. Okay, great. That's awesome. Thank Thanks. you, Alessandra. Thank you, Teresa. Well done. And uh, Thank you. Thanks, Teresa. Yeah. Thanks very much. Uh, so Shirley, we will ask you to join the stage. And before you uh, get going, uh, just mention that, you, you know, sometimes the questions will help 
clarify something for the audience. So that's great when it happens. And, um, you know, dragons, you know, keep that in mind. I know you do. Perfect. So, uh, Shirley, when you're ready, we'll get you started. Thank you. So I'm Shirley Cody, and I'm here to talk about translating videos um, automatically. So if you can move to the next slide, please. So this was actually a case of, of necessity being the mother of invention. We held an online conference. We had 32 videos we wanted to share in eight target languages, both with internal colleagues who don't necessarily speak English, as well as with industry professionals worldwide. This isn't confidential information, so there's no privacy concerns, although we, of course, want high quality. Um, these aren't HR or legal videos or promotional videos, so you don't need the absolute precision or maybe the transcreation that might come with a promotional type of video. Next slide, please. So the initial problem we hit was cost. Video subtitling, captioning, and localization is very expensive. Um, we priced this out. This would have cost us between 150 and 200,000 US dollars. There's a lot better things you can do with that money. Um, so why is it so expensive? Well, it's very complex to do. There's specialty applications that are built to let professionals do this type of work. Subtitles are notoriously difficult to translate because there's so many constraints around the length of the text, the text fitting to the screens, the sentences get cut off because of pauses or scene changes, that sort of thing. Um, automatic translation doesn't cope particularly well with sentence fragments, but the subtitles have to match what you see on the screen in a video. So if the scene changes mid-sentence, the subtitle has to, has to move on. Um, and last but definitely not least, subtitling on its own isn't enough to make your video accessible to those who are hearing impaired. So captioning uh, provides an accessible way for viewers who can't hear audio to watch the video versus subtitling, which provides an accessible way for speakers of any language to watch the video. Next slide, please. So what we came up with works perfectly for similar videos, so you don't need expert quality. There's no privacy concerns. What we're doing is we're sending the video to a large language model for subtitling. We then take that subtitle file and we generate a transcript that doesn't have the timestamps in it. We then use a large language model to summarize the text. We then send the subtitle text in batches to the large language model to translate along with the summary. So something along the lines of, given the subject matter of whatever, translate this block of subtitles while keeping the timestamps. In parallel, we're also sending the video to the large language model for captioning. We then take back all the results and we combine them together and that way we get a coherent and accessible target language video. That's our innovation with the hopes of making video localization, subtitling, captioning available to everyone. So thank you for your time. Thank you very much, Shirley. Uh, really interesting videos, LLMs. Have we heard that at least once already today? Dragons, mm -hmm. questions? So th thanks for the presentation. I'm, I'm still I'm trying to wrap my head around how the LMM adds that's value in this particular case because they're already you can already transcribe the SRT and then trans auto translate the SRT and then kind of just pop the segments right back into the same timestamp array. So what's the value that you're adding by running this through an LM that you wouldn't get by just having a machine translation of the auto transcription? So th there, are, there are a couple of things. Well, first of all, we're using the LLM to get the auto transcription um, and the captioning as well. So there's music playing in the background, the actor coughed or whatever it happens to be. Um, when we send things to, and, and we did try sending it to machine translation, but what happens is we're talking about segment fragments um, or blocks where we sometimes have to move clauses around. So one clause before the other in one language, and then we, we flip it around in a, in a target language, but it still has to match the scenes. So, Large language, well, machine translation, and what we're doing with the large language model, sorry, um, is we're sending it along with the context. So instead of just saying, here's what I need to, to translate, these are my subtitles, give me back a subtitle file, we're saying, this is the content, this is the summary, this is the message we're trying to get across, and now give me the subtitles that reflect that. 
So okay. The reassembling of the video becomes critical to essentially re recalibrating the, the subtitles to the content then. Uh, and is yeah. the fact that it's blue mean something, meaning that it's a not LLM solution? Correct. Is that is it also automatic? It is automatic, um, but that is our own development in there. So that's not using an LLM. And, and what we're doing, it, in, a, in kind of a simplified way, we're using overlapping batches when we send to an LLM. So let's say for the sake of argument, I send subtitles one to 10 and then five to 15 and then 10 to 20 and so on. So I have these overlapping batches so that I can get the actual context around what I'm sending. Um, and then yes, we're we're reevaluating it and putting it all together into the coherent video at the end. Okay, and we you. have actually, we, we did actually localize those 32 videos using this. And we had people within our, our company, native language speakers, check it out. And we tried a few different large language models to see which ones would give us the best results, that sort of thing. And we had uh, people checking it out. So we, we've actually put this to use. Great. Thank you very much. Thank you, Sherry. We're, we're time on questions. So uh we will move on thank you very much very interesting and next up is sharif so sharif we'll ask you to join the stage absolutely yeah. yeah we can hear you and over to you awesome. when you're ready sure so i am sharif i'm with the african languages lab not for profit that aims to foster awareness around low resource languages, mostly with respect to digitization and doing research. Um, next slide, please. That's a video, so one more. I should maybe try going next, it's gonna. Of course, I had to have the video problem. <laughs> It's okay. Um, we'll get it here. Yeah. If it does, yeah, seems like... going next. I think if you try going to the next slide, it usually plays. Okay. Let's try that. Just bear with us one second. No. Oh. I'll try once more. No. So I we we haven't seen that this was a video object. So what I would say, Sharif, uh, and I know this is an annoyance for you is if you, you wouldn't mind to send the video to me, if that's possible, and then we'll actually get you to start again in about 15, 20 minutes. That's okay. Yeah, that's fine. Is that all right? Perfect. Yeah, great. great. We'll come back to you, Sharif. It, it didn't embed, and sometimes that happens. So we, we'll start you again from the very start, if you can send the video, and then we'll embed it in there. Sure, and I'm more than happy to continue with this assess. Right? It's we, completely fine. We, we, we want you to have the the way you want it. So let's try that. And uh, sounds good. I'll send it over. Thank you very much. Thank we'll you. Come back to you. Thanks for your patience, Sharif. Who said we don't have gremlins at the pick, right? <laughs> Is that me? So uh, earlier than planned, Rafael will ask you to get ready. Yes. And, uh, uh, hi, everyone. Yes. We'll Can I just say that I, I, I really love the, the pick and I especially love the three cubed formats. Because yeah. it gives me a way of showing you uh, the path from um, a problem to a set of innovative ideas, right to the solution, right? Whoa, it's cool. <laughs> I, we're we're not sure. Do we duck that from the three minutes? <laughs> <laughs> you may, you may. No problem. No. Okay, yes. <laughs> I'm going. <laughs> Yeah. Over to when you, you're, Rafa. When you're ready. Our, 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 okay. So, apart comment, apart so. from that, I'm Rafa. I'm from XTM International. And uh, I'm going to tell you something about, again, large language models, or let's say a byproduct of large language models and how to use it. Can we go to the next slide? So uh, the thing is that uh, think of fuzzy matching, translation memory fuzzy matching. Let's imagine that you have the first sentence in your translation memory and you're now translating the second sentence. Now, can you? Do you know of any fuzzy matching mechanism that would really consider these two sentences similar? I don't, because uh, they the, those two sentences just do not have too many overlapping words, do they? Uh, but luckily, there is a technology that would see these two things uh, similar 
uh, and that's uh, and that's the large language models and specifically the magical embeddings, a way of converting text into numbers and then comparing it. So that's the way um, of diving into the semantics of a sentence and uh, it can bring you uh, some fantastic gains. Let's go to the next slide. Uh, let's say you have the following input sentence that you're working on right now, send the first version of the document. And now in your translation memory, you can have some, I would call them extended or boosted fuzzy matches. Uh, the, these these fuzzy matches would uh, would never be retrieved with classic fuzzy matching uh, algorithms, but there you can have them using the the te text embeddings from from large language models. And there's another idea. Let's go to the to to to, to the next slide. Uh, now think of, uh, of the following situation. You are uh, in the middle of the translation process. Uh, actually, uh, the uh, the first draft of the trans translation is complete and uh, you're translating from French into English and uh, you want to check if what you what you produce as a translation is uh, is a valid translation or, or, or is it okay to use. Uh, so you can look up your translation in the in the translation memory, but this time on the target side and see if there's a better phrasing of what you want to say, right? And um, by using uh, the, this uh, embeddings technology in a translation memory, you can first uh, increase the number of fuzzy matches you're getting. And when using uh, this as a, as a QA mechanism, that can uh, ensure better quality and better consistency of your translations. Uh, this technology is, uh, is under heavy development right now in the XTM AI team. We've run, run that on several examples and the uh, preliminary results are quite fascinating. So that's that's my innovation. Thank you. Thanks, Rafal. Uh, Dragons, do we have questions? Yeah, I have, I have one question to start off with. Uh, a lot of what matters there is the context. Uh, what, what, is, what, could, what could a phrase potentially be mean? Is there a sensitivity to the rest of the of related segments that are nearby in making recommendations for what other interpretations for a, a segment could could be, or is it just related to say synonyms of that or other ways of phrasing that particular uh, word? Yes, that's a, that's a very good question. It's a very very good idea for improvement actually, because the way we we are doing it now in these in these um, preliminary testing is that we are only considering the sentence itself. However, uh, by using embeddings, it is it is actually quite easy to uh, to include the context of uh, that that you find in the translation memory. You put it into the numbers too, and then you you you, you repeat the numbers comparison right so so that, that's a very good idea for the improvement of that do i am i a candidate for an innovation idea uh, can i absolutely can I yes yes <laughs> at all times yes ben did you have a question that that was a really interesting presentation so when are you creating the embeddings are you creating them both when the assets are segmented and then also creating additional embeddings on the translation target uh, yes, actually, uh, whatever you need to com uh, compare, uh, you have to generate the embeddings for it. So uh, for, for all those uh, segments that are in the translation memory, both source and, and target, we can generate it offline. So we can take our time and, and generate, generate those embeddings. We tried actually two different ways of generating the embeddings. Uh, one of them was, uh, it was doing it through the OpenAI API using the uh, text ADA other models, and the other one was uh, was to use open source uh, uh, embeddings generators. Um, either way, it takes a little time to do that for uh, for a large number of segments. But then, when you're translating, so when you're online, uh, then for your input sentence or the translation that your translated sentence that you're uh, concentrating on, uh, then you need to generate the the embedding as well, which takes a fraction of a second. Gotcha, gotcha. And are you then storing the embedding data with the textual data in the translation database, or are you maintaining a separate vector store and regular content database? Well, for now, technically, we are using uh, a dedicated uh, dedicated technology called the Chroma DB, right? That, that's been developed a few months ago, really, uh, j just for storing the embeddings. Great. Awesome. Thank you.
Thank you. Thanks for follow. Thanks, Dragons, for the question. Uh, just to clarify our running order for the last three here, we're going to have uh, Robert next from Argos, then we'll go to Gabriel Fairman, and then we're going to come back to Sharif and see if we can get his video working. So, uh, Robert, if you're ready, we'll have you join us on stage. I'll get your spotlight on here. And... Uh, yes, if you can hear me. We can hear you. Okay, so with that, uh, I shall start. Please. Hello, I'm Robert from Argos, and I'd like to tell you about the limitations of the current multilingual QA process and the solution we developed to combat them using programmatic and AI methods. Next slide, please. Uh, click, please. And another click. Uh, the bottleneck in this process is very visible in a few different areas, and you can click to the bottom, and I'll just... Uh, talk over it, uh, is very visible in a few different areas. The QA step follows the translation step and is not an intrinsic part of it. And in this step, translators are asked to review an extensive list of issues as part of their ass assignment. And this additional time needed can lead to delays further down the line. Now, in our solution, we combine QA and translation into one cohesive entity that works in real time uh, to reduce the time needed for QA and to reduce the number of false positives. We achieve this by combining an extensive library of regular expressions, a bit of programming, and a multi-step LLM prompting mechanism. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. Hello. There we go. And uh, one more click, one more click, and one. Oh, there we go. So in the old method, after translation is finished, the list of QA issues is generated, but it's often very extensive and riddled with false positives. And both generation and review of this list costs precious time. Click, please. But, but with our method, with the new method, segments are sent to QA just after they are translated. The QA classification system dictates which regular expressions and which LLM prompts are triggered, and the translator sees any issues in real time. Uh, click, please. On top of that, we made significant progress in tackling two most important QA issues, terminology and semantics. For terminology, we managed to remove 70% of false positives while retaining near perfect accuracy. Our approach takes into account inflectional endings that are the bane of the standard glossary check. Click, please. And for... Uh, uh, yes, and for semantics, uh, an area only accessible to humans. Until recently, we isolate meaningful sentences and use a multi-step LLM prompting method with anti-hallucination measures. Uh, and this way, we expose severe issues, additions, omissions, and mistranslations. Uh, click, please, to summarize. And you can click till the end. Only by combining programmatic means with LLM prompting can we achieve a system that far exceeds any of those two alone. Our system can learn over time to increase accuracy. It is API-based, so it can be plugged into any cut tool or text-based editor. And we can perceive it as a translation autocorrect on steroids, as it's offering significant time savings in the QA process, and especially in the terminology check. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Robert. Very interesting. Dragons, questions? So Robert, tell me, I, mean, I love, by the way, the fact that you're quantifying the, the value that you're creating, the 70% reduction in QA entries, 97 success rate. Could you explain those metrics a little more? And could you help help understand where 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 is that savings coming from? And what does that what where where does the savings manifest in your in your cost structure? Yes, yes. Uh, excellent question. Uh, the metrics we calculate since we, uh, in general, base all, uh, base all our observations of development on the database of QA issues we amass over time. For this specific uh, use case, what we did, we created a, a test set of 1,000 segments, 500 of them false positives, 500 of them true positive, a ground truth that was labeled by a human. Then we used a certain specific multi-prompting method where we introduce anti-hallucination. And with this, the model gave us back certain predictions pointing if those ground truth uh, test examples were actually true positive and false positive. And with this, we've been able to determine that they've hardly lost any 
true positives. And the only 3% you see missing here is in, in certain exotic collocations, like take into account when account was the glossary term. Uh, but in a construct into account, it's not really the term you're looking for. So those are the only uh, cases where the model is, is uh, making mistakes. And uh, on the cost side of things, uh, it simply translates into the time a translator has to spend on those things. You sometimes have a massive list of false positives or issues to go through for terminology alone. So with that, the translator can spend, well, 70% less time on that specific thing. And we already use this uh, API-based mechanism as in a certain commercial product. We have I actually pitched uh, at the last pick I was at an AITM cleanup. Here we have a way more interesting setting as it's not real time. So here we can have the time to drastically reduce the number of issues someone has to go through when they clean up a TM. So they don't have to spend a thousand hours on cleaning up terminology issues, but just 300 for very massive TMs. So ultimately it leads to uh, a feasible product in the space of cleaning up translation memories and a feasible SaaS product moving forward as connected to cut tools and different text editors. I hope that Thank answers the question. Thank you very much, Robert. Uh, and that is all the time we have for questions for you, but uh, let's move on to our next uh, innovator will be Gabriel. And right. I will add a spotlight for you just a second. We'll get you on stage here. And- How's my audio? Can, can you hear me, Alex? We can hear you just fine. Yep. Perfect, okay. And please uh, go ahead when ready. All right, well, th thank you everybody for everything that I've seen so far, great innovations from everyone. I'm gonna talk about our generative language engine in BureauWorks, BWX, our translation management system. Next slide, please. And if you can uh, play the video, um, I'll illustrate exactly how it happens. All right, so right now we have an example in Spanish. I'm adjusting the glossary. Our engine is going to make contextualized decisions based on the glossary in yellow, the machine translation in blue, and the TM in green. And in this case, it's privileging the TM. It's applying the translation, not finding any translation smells. Um, it works in over 200 languages. This example right now in, in Chinese, it's going to, by deleting a character, it's going to find out that there is a problem with the translation. It's flagging what the problem is and suggesting how to fix it. Um, now, switching over to Portuguese, um, I'm going to change the verbiage from create to generate. And then I'm going to ask the AI to translate it. And it's flexing the sentence in order to make that work. If I delete a word, again, it's going to flag for uh, problems with the uh, translation, and I, as a translator, I may or may not choose to implement that. And uh, everything that you're seeing is powered uh, by GPT instances, both in Microsoft Azure and OpenAI. Uh, enterprise clients can point this to their own uh, specific instances if necessary. And if we can go to the next slide, please. So the essence is we're not using GPT as a translation engine in any means. We're using it as a linguistic conflict resolver. So instead of having to work with different corpuses, corpi of knowledge coming from machine translation glossaries and TMs, you have a single feed that has been resolved. It solves, uh, cuts back on editing time uh, in over 50%, maintains control for uh, the translator. So the idea is going from translator to language flow architect, really trying to empower the, the linguist. There's a lot of machine learning going on in the background. Uh, we can go into that and if we can go into the next slide. So the idea is instead of having multiple workflow steps to achieve uh, high quality enterprise grade translations, we're talking about pulverized, iterative micro learning steps that are happening between the translator, um, the different contexts that are being offered from glossaries, TMs, TBs. Uh, you can work with multiple uh, machine translation options as well, which enhances the quality of uh, the feeds that are provided what we call uh, transition critics that all offer alternative suggestions as well. 
but the essence really is not just using, let's say, um, uh, uh, an, NL an NLM as a prompt and response mechanism, but rather focusing on the dynamic elements to create translations that really make sense um, and that enhance the human experience. And I think that's pretty much it. I'm open to questions and thank you everybody for your time. Thanks, Gabriel. Dragons, questions? All right, I'll 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 play. Um, so I think what I, what I'm seeing the core value is that the translator has a more is more efficient because they're getting feedback from multiple different channels while they're doing the work, so they can see if there is problems using these different channels of input. Am I reading that right? That's part of it. Yeah, that's the, the let's say the feedback is coming from what we call BWX translation smells. That's flagging for semantic, not not just syntactical, but semantic issues with the translation. So deviations in meaning, like incorrect translations, awkward translations, gender bias, and things like that. That's the that's part of the feedback loop. But what's happening is that the translator is also getting a resolved feed. So instead of, for instance, having a fuzzy match that conflicts with the glossary or a TM that conflicts with the glossary or two different diverse Divergent TM feeds, which happens very frequently, these um, th these divergences are being resolved so that the translator can actually be left with the task of reading through it and making changes when necessary, as opposed to doing that grunt work of transporting, let's say, either a fuzzy match or a machine translation match into something that's more human grade. Right. So you're not only giving them a lot of, uh, you're giving them support materials from multiple channels, both in terms of interpreting what their translation is, as well as cross-referencing from other sources, such as TurnBase or other, other uh, places. Um, so I think that ultimately the value creation is in a higher quality output from the translation step at, at that stage, and theoretically a higher throughput. Have you measured that? Have you measured the quality output of the yeah. translators in these two scenarios, either with regards to how many, say, segments they can handle per hour or how many errors tend to get through. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we, we have um, very detailed quality measurements around everything that gets done in, in BWX from a, a, a just gross number perspective because I don't have the fine ones with me. What we've observed is, and, and this is very contingent on translator behavior as well, because some translators like to work with the technology, others work more against the stream of it. But uh, translators that work with the feeds, we, we can observe, and obviously it's also uh, subject matter dependent as well, but we, we can see up to 50% more uh, productivity from um, a productivity framework perspective. And we also see at the very least 20% diminishing in um, semantic errors and provided that comparing to human standards, right? We're not comparing to machine translation. Compared to machine translation, it's huge, but compared to humans, we, we see a 20% decrease in semantic errors through the tool. Great. Um, thank you, Gabriel. Thank you, Dragons. Um, we'll move on. Um, we have, um, you may remember, we have Sharif who uh, well, didn't have the video working. That was on us. Sometimes this can happen. I think we have a fix. So Sharif, we'll ask you back on stage. Sounds good. Um, once Fingers again, I'm Sharif. Here. Right. <laughs> Over to you. Sure. Once again, I'm Sharif. I'm with the African Languages Lab, a not-for-profit that fosters the awareness and digitization of low-resource languages with an African focus. Um, next slide, please. It is working. So. It is not working, but it is fun. The there we go. Okay, it I... is working. <laughs> so I want to start with what I'm calling the objective truth, um, a basis that we can all agree on, which is to train better machine learning models or LLMs as been as has been used today. More data is better. We need data to make that happen. Now, if you could please go to the next slide and the video is. How do you go about collecting data when you're working in a setting like the African landscape where you have over 2,000 languages? Now, this screenshot you see is a visualization from the African Languages Lab website 
And all the red nodes you see are actually expandable. So just these are 2000 languages and they grow very, very quickly. Now that is the space where the African Languages Lab does its work. And so it's like, how do we go about collecting data on 2000 languages to build reliable machine learning models or machine translation models? Next slide, please. Our solution is a tool called All Voices. Um, it's a very simple and intuitive tool that allows you to both record contributes and verify both written, or, i.e. text and audio translation, all within a single platform. I'll just go over some of the key points of All Voices real quickly. I think Shirley said this, necessity is the matter of innovation. Um, base All Voices was built out of necessity that we didn't have a reliable platform for us to collect data on low resource languages. We didn't want to build this, but we just had to. So that's one. The app is very intuitive and it's very user friendly, as you can see from the screenshot, just thumbs up, thumb down, skip, play. Um, there is a direct translation between all low resource languages that we have on our platform. You don't need to go through English, which is always a major limitation for collecting data on low resource languages. You always have to go through English. Now, to use BASE, you can have your choice of in-house team a team that is verified and their translations essentially are verified much quicker, then you can just leave it up to the community and that is more like a crowdsourcing setting where people can validate your data through the pipeline. All Voices is open and free to everyone to use and contribute to. So that is our innovation and I look forward to your questions. Thank you, Sharif. And thank you for your patience um, with us. We finally got through. Uh, let, let's see what the dragons have to say. Alessandra. Yeah, thanks, Sharif. This is very cool, especially because it's so easy, it seems like, in terms of accessibility. Um, I was wondering, how do you recruit, recruit uh, you know your users to for the input i mean from the graph you know the, the slide you showed there's a lot of languages and i'm sure that some of them don't have many speakers uh, how do you even go about that i know this is not an innovation question <laughs> but it's very interesting right i do think that's a, the million dollar question right there mm. it's extremely hard to get people especially on the really end of those nodes where the languages are going extinct are on the verge of being extinct. To that, honestly, we haven't found a reliable solution, but right now what we try to do is partner with on-ground and in-country groups and nonprofits who are also looking to, you know, preserve their languages and make them not go extinct. They don't have a tool like this. This is the first of its kind, at least to the best of our knowledge. So this is something they're also very eager to be part of and also contribute and share their data or also get people to contribute to their data. Yeah, cool. Do, so I know this is specific for African languages. Do you envision something like this could be used for you know, other low resource languages or are there specific you know, uh, models that are uh, designed for these languages that are being used here? Besides, I guess the direct translation is one of them. Right. Um, honestly, there is no limitation to whatever language test we can put in. We can just specify as many languages as we want. But as you mentioned, at least at right now, we're just narrowing on the African languages. And with these African languages, we even have a specific window of languages that we are looking at right now. So we do think in the future, we're going to expand that window a bit more. And maybe we might go beyond the African continent. Thank you. Great. Um, Eric, do you have a question for Sharif? Is that, David, did you ask me? Because I literally always have a question. <laughs> no, uh, yeah. Sharif, this is super interesting. And obviously, uh, the mobile first platform makes a huge difference uh, in, in accessibility, especially in Africa. I mean, that's kind of the primary mode of, of interaction. Um, I, I guess I'm, I'm thinking about the, the, this is a data collection and an and annotation function. So you're able to collect audio or text inputs. You can go language to language. So there's a, bi there's a bilingual aspect to it. And then there's also potentially an annotation or, or validation step that's going on. Could you tell a little more about the validation part of it? Like walk me through how does, how do you test 
how do you confirm that what you're inputting is correct? And there could be a variety of errors in that process. So like, how do you clean up the data that you're either collecting or, or translating in this case? Right. Um, I guess I should start off with the premise of saying we are trusted people. That's the first assumption mm -hmm. that the majority of the people are going to be doing the right thing. So by that, the pipeline of how data goes from being raw to being validated is we have the first text translation and five people, right? So I did mention earlier that there are in-house validations and crowdsourcing. When we are crowdsourcing, we want to get a thumbs up of five. So if some, if we have one thumbs up, that counts at one point to that language. If there's a thumbs down, that counts at minus two points. So if you have a text or a recording that has more thumbs down than thumbs up, then that is rejected. But if you have more thumbs up, then the numbers increase, but not as fast as thumbs down. And that leads to the first layer of validation. Now we plug it after we are done, at least for the languages that the African Languages Lab is currently working on, we try to have an in-house check after we've sort of pulled the data from our, um, from the database, we try to have our in-house team do an in-house check. But really, we are first trusting in people and in that crowdsourcing community-centric approach to data collection. Yeah, that makes sense. And yet, can I squeeze in one more question? Oh, is, 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 is Are some of those languages blocked by encoding problems, like being able to have an appropriate script for them? Or are you able to find a, a script for everything that you need? See, that is one of the big hurdles that we've overcome. I did say that we are looking at specific windows of languages right now. We've tried to resolve those encoding issues for that language window we are looking at now. But as we continue to expand that language window, we do expect to come up to encounter a lot more of these issues. And we might need to come up with some clever and innovative ways. But we have ways to resolve them. But I mean, I know we're out of time, so I'm not going to go into details. All right. Thank you, Sharif. Absolutely. Thank you, Sharif. And thank you for saving us a discussion going down the encoding rabbit hole. Um, you know, Eric and you and maybe some others, we can take it offline. Um, two thumbs up, right, um, from me to you and all of the innovators today. Um, here they are. And um, Alex, that was a good show. Another great show. So we've had uh, eight innovators yesterday, nine today, uh, 17 total innovators. And now our dragons have the difficult work of deliberating. Uh, every innovator um, in the competition receives feedback. So regardless of whether they receive an inv invitation to the final round, we hope it's a positive experience for everyone. Those who are not selected for the final round are also welcome to pitch again in a future, future pick as well. So uh, good luck to all of our innovators and dragons. You have the, the the difficult task ahead of you now so uh yeah dave super excited we'll be on stage in uh san jose at Loke world 50 in about six weeks and uh what's the process now and uh when do you think we'll uh, publish our results well yeah i mean not looking too far ahead <laughs> one of the things that uh alex does here is he'll post this recording up on uh Lock world's youtube channel so you can all, you know, if you want to see yourself pitching or see some of your, your fellow innovators, that's where you'll find them. And uh, you'll find information on when that happens through our uh, social media channels. Um, and yeah, it's uh, decisions need to be made next week. So about midweek, uh, we'll have results going out. You'll hear from either Alex or I. Uh, and then after that, finalists just need to prepare for the final and we'll give instructions on that. So uh that's it for us today um great you can you know thank you for showing up thank you to our dragons and um we hope to see you at a future pick thanks again everyone on behalf of Ulrich Hennis and Donna Parrish the founders of Loke World uh this has been the 15th uh, process innovation challenge preliminary rounds and we look forward to seeing you uh in October in San Jose thanks and have a great day everyone Thank you very much. Bye, everybody. Thank you. Goodbye. Thank you. Bye.